So we're going to get this thing lined up. Um, sorry, your name? Stanley? Anthony. Uh, so we got this. We do have the rubber dummy model today. And uh, do you have, uh, Anthony, do you have a foot pedal by any chance? I'm just used to that. So, Dr. Yeah. Nelson's going to get this lined up. Another really critical um, assessment when you're doing pot potentially doing a vertiflex procedure is to make sure this is not a post-surgical level, because this depends on the integrity of the lamina. The, this is a very safe procedure unless you don't make sure the patient's uh, diagnostic are, criteria are correct. Um, if you attempted to put this into a patient that had an insecure or a, a decompressed lamina, um, then this could potentially migrate into the central clinic. And then you will be grateful for your collaborative relationships with your surgeons. Okay, so uh, we're going to get started here. I'm going to, on this rubber dummy, going to start out at the uh, this inner space right here, which I believe is four or five. And I get that line up. I, I like using this ring forceps. And to get that thing lined up, make sure we've got a good orthogonal view on the on our C arm. So infiltrate with local anesthesia. Um, vast majority of these are done under MAC, IV, deep IV sedation. No need for general anesthesia with this procedure. So go in and after we've done our local, just just simple stab wound incision. And then take our first instrument here. So the first instrument he's using is an introducer assembly. Dilator assembly. And then I'll This is a go slow to go fast moment in the procedure. You need to get yeah. this aligned correctly or everything else will be difficult. So you'll see him pay a lot of attention here to making sure the introducer is So what um, I like to do is, is uh, when you get this in position between the spinous processes, I like to do it in, without too much floral, just give it a little kind of 360 just to kind of line it and get a feel, kind of give yourself a three dimensional feel for that. Can you see the cups on either side? They should be flanking, they should be surrounding the spinous processes above and below. And I think we've got, the, so now we see the sphere spinous process there, inferior process there, and then we go ahead. Oh, yeah, well, sure, yeah let's go ahead with that lateral, Anthony. So lateral, he moves to a lateral, a lateral image once he gets it aligned perfectly between the spinous processes because this is a sharp instrument, and you need to be sure that you are as you advance it with the mallet, um, that it is not going, you know, it is not violating the central canal, which it potentially could. You're going right up to the back of the spinal laminar line on your lateral imaging. So I think you can see on this, we're right between those spinous processes right there. And uh, that looks pretty good. So the handle easily it clicks this off. Up, loosen the collar up. And then the introducer cannula goes over, uh, over this. Secondary oh, cannula sorry, the here. Cannula. cannula assembly. And then hammering that through. Depending on how tight the spinous processes are, you can imagine that this is a pretty potentially pretty stimulating moment. Right about for there. A little bit generous on the depth there, so I'm gonna back that out. We do have a uh, rubber model here, which is a approximate the human body, but not quite there. So. Now we've got our, so then we put our rasp in, so a reamer. This is a reamer, so it's reamer. just going to disrupt you reamer, the inner spinous rasper. ligament so that when the, when the implant and is again, I like to look that also under fluoro as I'm doing it. And sometimes you get stuff out of here, you wipe it off, go back several times. 
And this is a sizer. He'll grip the handle, and on the handle there's a measurement. Which kind of a caliper's here to take that measurement. So those little white marks at the top will tell you what size spacer you're going to select. This is a sizer. The average size, as we mentioned earlier, is 12 millimeters. Picture there. So uh, we've got like a, this looks like, I usually do it until you see this, uh, <clears throat> see this piece just kind of bouncing up a little bit and uh, you know you're pretty much right there. So that we got the 14 going right there. Your hand will know. This is, it's, it's very difficult to describe, but you do feel when it becomes stiff. Like this. And then we have the device here, ready to deploy, going right in. So the, the implant is on the end of this instrument, which dis deploys the instrument. And then there is a, a turn device on the end of it. So you turn that device, and it causes the legs to expand out. And as you do that, you're watching very carefully to make, that, that make sure that the legs are on Let's either side the, of the spinous process. Check the APB there. <clears throat> Again, I want to make sure those tongs are on either side of the spinous process as we deploy it. So he'll just start to expand and take a picture, and once he's confident that they're in the right trajectory, then he'll just go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just do it there. I feel like I need to bring the collar back a little bit here. Can we go back to lateral? Sometimes if your implant is, is too far ventral, when you try to expand it, those little legs will catch on the lamina. So that's what he's talking about here. I think he just retracted it a little bit mm -hmm. because at a later time, we will mallet that more ventrally. We just yeah, need I'll to get it. You see how he pulled it back? Trying to bring that collar back a little bit. When he says collar, he's talking about the introducer cannula. So if you try to open it too far ventrally, as you do, those little legs are going to catch. Like that, he may have difficulty opening. There we go. Let's take the AP view again. Also, that reamer, if you do that really well, you're going to have an easier time opening these because that's just tearing up the inner spinous ligament for you so that they, it's less likely to snag. So yeah, it looks like it's off, and he may be able to recover this by tilting the whole assembly as he continues to open. It doesn't have to be symmetrical around, that, around the spinous process. It just has to have to one leg on either side. Yeah. We'll do a caudal encephalad there, Andrew. So he's going to tilt the extra in the up. other direction so we can see the, the uh, legs on the inferior spinous process. That looks beautiful. And then other side. Looks like we're straddling that pretty good. All right. And let's go back to lateral. Yeah, so this straddle he's referring to are the two legs of the implant inferiorly, and you can see the, L uh, the L4 spinous process right between them. So now finishing this up. On lateral, when you open this up, similarly, you just want to be watching, observing that the upper and lower legs are opening up symmetrically because it can get caught um, as you're doing this. Not very common, but it does. Once it's at a 90 degree angle, the, the legs relative to the cannula, as it is now, 
and you're all finished. And there is a hard stop. Mm -hmm. It's easy to distinguish this. And then the entire device is going to be <laughs> malleted ventrally so that the legs lay along the back of the spinal laminar line. I caught on, caught on cranial view again, Andrew. If you work with older surgeons, they may bemoan older devices like Coflex and, uh, and others. Looks pretty good. Talk Check about the these caudal. becoming displaced. This this device was designed very specifically in its um, in the way it's delivered as well as its dimensions, so that if we push it lateral, ventrally, please. as he's going to demonstrate, it is extremely unlikely that this would migrate out from between the spinous processes. And there's a large data registry. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. that has demonstrated this to be the case. So he's double checking its placement. He's gonna use a small mallet. Mallet it down. Dr. Pilkington. Yeah, so what you'll see is stop. at the, He's going to deploy it by um, flipping the handle, which releases uh, a little, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it. There we go. Check one There's last a little AP catch in the, uh, in the back of the, of the device. If you needed to remove this device, you would make an incision right over your, your incisional scar from before, usually a little bit larger because you need to be able to see the back. Um, and you use the same tools to re-snap into that and then uh, counterclockwise to release the legs. All right. Any questions on that? Yes. Is there a point of no return when you're deploying no. the device to make adjustments? No. No, there's no point of no return until you lift the handle and then it's released from the whole assembly. So you can take it up or down as you go. Yeah. Um, you know, and another thing that is worth mentioning here, there was a question about removing it. This is really quite easy to remove. We don't hear our surgeons complain about the, um, you know, the, the work of removing this if they're going to subsequently do a surgery at this level. In comparison to some products for interspinous inter spacer de um, ex uh, yes, that, 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 are, that do include fusion, which would be a little bit more pro problematic in that situation. So chronically though, <clears throat> bone loves titanium, and this is like a barbed wire through a tree. And if you let it stay in there for a while, and if you CT scan, you'll find that it fuses around this. And this, this is common. It's very common to fuse around. So yes, it is easy to take out, but it, it can be very difficult. When you have to take it out using Lexel, a drill, and everything else, you'll, you'll realize that. So just beware that when this is in for a while, it can be very difficult to take out. We haven't talked about that yet. So Dr. Lee mentioned that, it's almost nothing. I mean, they're sore for three or four days and it's a, it's a very quick recovery. The incision is about 12 millimeters. In my experience, the first thing people say is, is that their, their limb pain, the extremity pain is improved. Um, and it's a little difficult um, at that one week appointment, they're still kind of talking a little bit about soreness, which isn't terrible, but some soreness. And so they may not realize the back pain relief uh, immediately. So in my experience, by the you know 10 day appointment post-operative, people are starting to say, oh, I think my leg pain is better. And then when I see them a month later, they're starting to, to report the back pain relief as well. I was just going to mention to, uh, some potential complications, spinous process fracture. Um, and of course, we, get, we typically get, um, uh, what's the studies we get for bone, bone density exams on all our patients prior to this. Um, but I've had two spinous process fractures that happen post-op, and they're basically non-events. Uh, referred them both eventually for... Uh, laminectomy decom decompression, I think in both cases, my colleague, Dr. Stone, just left the implant in and there was no reason not or to take it out. It was, it was non-event. So, I mean, that spinous process fracture can happen and will happen in, in a small number of patients. It's really kind of a, it's a kind of a nothing burger. 
I've so. had a lot more than two. They do okay. happen. So if they do happen, the, based on the pivotal trial, you do nothing, and two-thirds of them will resolve with no treatment whatsoever. Just, just watch and wait. For the ones that don't resolve, you're going to have to modify those somehow. And the, I don't want to get into that. The revision of mild is really beyond the scope of what we have here. Yes, severe osteoporosis is a relative contraindication to it. What you can do is do something radical, like actually treat their osteoporosis and then do it in six months, much the same as our spinal deformity colleagues do. I would recommend you do that. The other thing that you can do is spinous process augmentation. Put cement into the spinous process. If you've seen any of my cases, they will all have spinous process augmentation. It prevents subsidence because how many of these spacers will subside? What percentage? All of them. <laughs> all of them. It's just to a certain degree. So with that, I think well, let's take a break. Uh, visit your, the exhibitors here in the room next, next to us. Uh, and we'll resume with an interspinous fusion spacer demo uh, in a few minutes after that.